All right, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. We, we sang this song, um, Extravagant. It's a word you're going to hear a number of times. You'll probably get sick of that word by the time I'm done. Um, and it's a word we associate with excess. Right? It's a word where it means you, you are lavishing, there's no restriction, it's just pouring out. Um, there was a royal wedding in England, right? $700,000, $800,000 for this thing. That's extravagant. Right? You write a car that can drive itself and it's super nice, but it costs a lot of money. That's extravagant. So we know what extravagance means when it comes to tangible, material things, weddings, galas. But would you ever use that word? For the love of Jesus. Whether it be you've experienced extravagant love from him or you've given extravagant love to him. Not sure if those two worlds have collided for you. But I challenge you and say, if you have not ever thought of the love of Jesus, whether receiving or giving as extravagant, you haven't really known Jesus. You might have known about him. You might like what you see from a distance. But the closer you get the more extravagant it becomes. And I wanted you to see this in this series called Up Close and Personal, a woman who gets to meet Jesus up close and personal. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. We'll pause there for a moment, because already so much has happened in this narrative. And what you see is... This extravagant love this woman has for Jesus. Look at some of the details here. Who is this woman? We're not given a lot of information. We, we're just no, uh, she's known as a sinner. That's how she's defined. That she's lived a sinful life. And clearly, she's rather notorious because the Pharisees uh, can see her and, and immediately knows her as the sinner. So most scholars think she's a town harlot. She's the town prostitute. I'm sure there's a number of them, but she's rather notorious, probably has a fairly booming business because she's immediately identified by the onlookers and by the Pharisee as the sinner. Imagine, you're not known as a carpenter, as a blacksmith, you know, as a baker, you're known as the sinner. That's pretty heavy. And what's surprising is that she's in the last place you would think a sinner would want to be, in a Pharisee's home. The Pharisees were the religious elite. They were the teachers of the law. They were the ones who kind of governed the, the, the church back then, or the synagogue, and, 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 and that's the last place a sinner would want to end up. So how does she get there? Does she break in and enter? Does she just kind of bum rush in? Um, we have The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. We've got these spaces where celebrities come, they talk, they're interviewed, and the world gets to look on through their TV. Well, their version of that is a dinner like this. Uh, a well-to-do person with a large home would invite a luminary, a celebrity, you know, the, the, the cutting edge of theology. They'd bring them into the house. They'd open the doors to the courtyard, and the village would come and look through the door to see, what are they talking about? They try to overhear a conversation. And for the host, it was a good moment because they felt like they're important. The whole town's gathered in my courtyard, and I've got a VIP, and I get to talk to him directly. That's what's happening here. Jesus was preaching. Crowds were gathering. The Pharisees were curious. So this Pharisee probably invited his colleagues to come and talk to Jesus. And the town had gathered at the courtyard, and they're peering in, trying to figure out what are they talking about? And you're supposed to stay at the threshold if you're not invited. You're not supposed to just blunder in. It's guest only. But in comes this woman. And you can just picture this. 
She comes in, and everyone gasps. And so the first thing you see about the extravagant love of this woman towards Jesus is the fact that she strolls right into the lion's den. She doesn't care. She's got to get close. And as she walks in, you can imagine whatever conversation they were having stops. You could see jaws drop. You could probably hear the murmur of the crowd behind them. Like, what is she doing? For these Pharisees who were eating, it's like anthrax walked in. That's how they'd feel. Because ceremonially and spiritually, if someone that dirty, someone who is defined as a sinner walks in, like, it could defile your food. It could defi- if you touch her, it could defile your, your spiritual cleanliness. I mean, like, they're alarmed. It's not just some person that walked in, but the sinner of the town walked in. And then you see her, and so all these men are reclining. It's a low table. Back then, they would, they would eat with their bodies splayed out, their feet away from them. They're all kind of leaning on an arm at a low table. This woman walks in. She positions herself behind Jesus' feet. Everyone's looking at this. This is weird. This is weird. And then she begins to weep. She begins to bawl. I mean, it's one thing you walk into the lion's den, but when you lose all control of your emotions, have you ever been uh, at a wedding where you got to give a speech and you're like, just snot everywhere and you can't control yourself? It is humiliating. And so she becomes really vulnerable and she, she pours out her emotions in front of a small group? No. In front of men who hate her with a crowd looking in who hate her the same. And she's bawling. She's bawling so much that her tears begin to wet Jesus' feet. Remember, he's laid out, his feet are low, uh, and she's bawling. And then she undoes her hair, which, again, is a sign of extreme vulnerability because back then you only undo your hair for your husband. And so for her to undo her hair, I mean, this is, ex- this is extreme undressing for her emotionally. And she bends down and begins to dry his his feet with her hair. And then she begins to kiss his feet, which is weird now and it's weird back then. It's not normal. (laughs) That's extreme humility. Extreme humility. And then she gets up and she remembers why she came. She takes her jar of perfume, which is a year's salary, typically, or more. It could be her life savings. And she pours it all over his feet. Now, you've met some men who spritz a little too much cologne. Like, oh, my gosh. It's like a a gas cloud of bad. Imagine an entire bottle empty. That's the smell permeating through the room, out the door, down the street. Extravagant. In fact, the uh, reaction of the Pharisees are probably the kind of reactions we'd have. Like, what is her deal? Indignant. Who does she think she is? Walking right up into my party, making a fool of herself, embarrassing my guests. And, and, and then in a different passage, there's another account of something similar. It's not the same, but some, a woman bathed Jesus in perfume, and, and the response there was, what a waste of money. And I'm sure there were some men thinking that too. Is How dare she, and how, what a waste Jesus, verse 47 says, this woman loves me greatly. The men there, they're indignant. They feel offended. They think it's a waste. And Jesus says, no. Of all the people in this room, she's got it right. She sees what none of y'all see, and she loves me. And she loves me greatly. Next point, let's figure out why. Why does she respond this way? It's because it's a response to an extravagant love, extravagant Savior. This woman is the only woman who sees Jesus the way he really is. So let's look at verse uh, 40 and read through the rest of this passage. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. And two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? 
Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. What Jesus is saying is the reason this woman is acting a fool and doing all this extravagant stuff is because she's responded to something. If you notice down in uh, verse 47, it says her many sins have been forgiven. That's a past tense grammar. It, it happened sometime in the past and continuing to the present, but it wasn't in that moment. It means that Jesus is implying that he met her at some time prior. And she responded to his teaching or to his healing, but there was a moment where this woman saw Jesus as a lover of sinners and heard this message that if she put her faith in this man, in the Son of God, that she can be forgiven, set free, made whole, made a daughter of God, and she received that, and for the first time in her whole life, her name wasn't just sinner, but forgiven, healed, loved, dignified, beautiful. She felt things she had never felt for probably many decades. And she was overwhelmed. She was overwhelmed by amazing grace. She's so grateful. And Jesus tries to teach Simon what he's, what he's really getting at. He says, Simon, let me tell you a parable. One guy owes someone $200,000. Another guy owes someone $2,000. And the money lender forgives both. Who's happier? Who's happier? You guys all know? The one with the bigger debt. The reason she's losing her mind is that, yes, she was a notorious sinner, but she's been forgiven and she's overwhelmed by the mercy. And that is not to then say there's a class of people who need to be forgiven little and therefore never can access that joy. What he's saying is you all are blind. You all are like this woman. Maybe not in the same way, but your pride, your arrogance, your hypocrisy, your secret lusts, all your hidden sins, you don't think you need mercy? If you could see like this woman could see, you'd all be kissing my feet. You'd all be pouring out stuff, but you're blind. You're blind. Now, they at least have an excuse. Jesus was alive, and he's teaching, he's doing miracles, but if you weren't there to see it, you're hearing second, third hand. We live on the other side of the cross, and there's no question of how much Jesus loves us. If you think what this woman was doing was extravagant, she's just a dim reflection of the amazing love he's poured out for us. This woman entered a hostile room. Yeah, that's a lot. But Jesus entered a hostile world, incarnated into a world that would wound him and hate him and kill him, yet he came. That's extravagant. You think this woman weeping tears in public is extravagant? Yeah, it's, it's a lot. But Jesus wept in Gethsemane and shed blood in sweat, knowing what he'd face for your sake, to wear your sins, to be abandoned by the Father. That's extravagant. You think this woman undoing her hair and being vulnerable is much? Yes. Jesus was stripped naked, beaten, crown of thorns pressed into his head, hung like a spectacle. No one could be more vulnerable than that. He did that for you. You think this woman pouring out her life savings at Jesus' feet was something? Jesus shed his blood, poured out his life that he might have you. The reason this woman and the reason we are to respond with extravagant love it's because you have an extravagant Savior who held nothing back but poured out everything he has 
to pursue you and love you. And the whole point of this story, the reason it's in the Bible, is, is to say we don't have an option to sit like the Pharisees and observe Jesus and interact with him with cool and distant respect. The only possible response, if you see Jesus for who he is, is to lose your mind and to pour out. So, my last point, what's your response? And you might say, Dion, this... I, I, okay, I get it. It's nice. What does that mean? Do I lift two hands in the air when I sing now? <laughs> do I do four-hour quiet times? Like, what does it look like? What does this mean? And, you know, how, how do I respond extravagantly? Well, let me appeal to something you all are familiar with, or at least if you haven't experienced it, you've seen it. You think you might know about it. How many of you have fallen in love before? Okay, most of you. I hope some married folks raise their hands. <laughs> I see some couples over there. I'm like, ooh, you need some counseling. Um, if you're married, if you're dating or engaged, or you've, been, you've dated before or you've seen enough movies, you understand the idea of falling in love. And you realize God has given us this powerful metaphor and analogy of what it's like to lose your mind in extravagance when you fall in love with somebody. Um, in my hands, I hold this beat-up tin case. Um, the backstory is, I fell in love with my wife on the missions trip. You're not supposed to mix missions with love. Missions team, take notice, all right? <laughs> but I did. Um, I fell in love with her on the missions trip. But I couldn't say it there. There was rules against that. So um, I wanted to wait and talk to her after, but... She had committed the next year to God and academics. No guys. She said, no guys. I said, darn, that's a whole year I got to wait before I can even mention how I feel about her. And so what I did was I bought some stationery in this tin can. And I, just, I decided to write letters to her every few days to talk about how much I'm praying for her, how much I love her what I'm thinking about, where I am, just, just chitter-chatter, you know, stuff. Like, I wish I could call her and say this, but I can't, so, so I'll write letters to her. And my hope was one day I get to ask her out, and we make a connection. She falls in love with me, and I can hand her this and say, see, I pursued you for a year without knowing. <laughs> and, um, and that day came. She finished her finals for that year. She was just finishing her sophomore year. I was just out of college. And then uh, we, we got on our first date right after her finals. She tells me she's been praying for me for a year. I'm like, yes, God, thank you. Thank you. I, I got the in here. This is easy. And, um, and then we, uh, we dated a few more times. And I took her to the airport. And I hand her this, this thing. And I say, hey, when you're inside the plane, open it and take a look. And she thought I was handing her stationery. So she was like, okay, thank you. And uh, <laughs> that's a weird gift, just stationery. But she opens it up, and there are hundreds of letters in there for her. And I thought I'd read you just a random, <laughs> random one. This is <laughs> hundreds of stuff like this. <laughs> Julie, I can't get my mind off of you. <laughs> I'm wondering what you're doing, what you're thinking. I check my email every half hour in hopes that you've written this, this, is, this, gets, this gets silly. The very name Julie is so enchanting. Each time I see it, I pause. Your face floods my mind and I lose my stomach just to read your name, dot, dot, dot. And it's just like hundreds of this. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no. That's not... That, that wasn't for applause. <laughs> I share it because this is extravagant. And if you're wondering, what does it mean to love Jesus extravagantly? You've all felt that before yeah. and have done that before, where you're willing to pour out in love. Now, you've done that to your girlfriend, to your fiance, to your wife. Is it weird for you to do that for Jesus? And yet, that's what Jesus is asking for. Not religion, but relationship. 
There's a passage in Revelations chapter 2 where Jesus speaks to a church. And it was written to seven churches, but it's meant for all the churches from that time on. And Ephesians 2, I'm sorry, Revelations 2, he he talks to the church of Ephesus. And this is what he says. He says in chapter 2, verse um, 2, he says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance, dot, dot, dot. You persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. He commends that. He says, I like your orthodoxy. You persevered. You hung in there. Good. But then he says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. This is Jesus saying, it's not good enough that you believe the right doctrines. And it's not good enough you just come and spill a seat and give your tithing envelope. That, that's good, but what I did not die and resurrect so you can stay at a distance. I want you to love me and experience my love like it's no, no other relationship on earth. Do you remember what you used to did it, what you did at first when you fell in love with Jesus? I remember. Back then we didn't have this beautiful screen and a great band. We had a busted youth pastor and a busted guitar. He's a good youth pastor, actually. And uh, and there was a transparency machine, remember that? With these old plastic sheets with Sharpie on it. <laughs> Those of you who just became Christian recently, that was like way back. Anyway. And, and I would sit there in the front row counting how many sheets are in the worship leader's hand because I wanted to keep singing. I couldn't get enough of it. I'd be in the Bible hours at a time. I would speak in tongues and I would listen to the pastor like life or death. I would immediately obey. And that was like seventh, eighth, ninth grade. That was my first love for Jesus. And Jesus is like, can we go back to that, please? No dead orthodoxy. No just coming. No, just sitting in the back, looking at Jesus. I want you to be like this woman. Pour out. All right, pastor, what does that mean? Two hands up, two hands and a leg. Like, what does that mean? Let me challenge you in this way. The first thing I did once I knew that my, I was in love with my wife, my future wife back then, and she was in love with me, I went to my photo album, and I took out every picture of my ex-girlfriend. It was easy. I just had one. <laughs> and I dug through my bag of cards and notes and took out all the flirty letters, which again was easy because not a lot of girls flirted with me. So it was a fairly quick process. But the first thing that happens when you know you love somebody is that becomes exclusive. It's fully surrendered. Where you say, like John Legend says, All of me loves all of you. And that was my act of just surrendering, like no more, no other girls, no other flirty things, just just you, Julie, just you. This woman brought her alabaster jar. What do you think prostitutes do with perfume? There's a a chapter in Proverbs that talks about the way of the adulteress, and her words are, this is the adulteress, Someone whose living is to seduce. She writes, I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deep of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. Perfume was attached to seduction. And I can imagine that jar of perfume was like her livelihood. This is what enabled her to get customers. And if that ever dried up or she got too old, At least she could sell this and be okay. What does she do with it? She takes her treasure. She takes the thing that fueled her lifestyle. She takes the thing that she put her hope in, and she pours it all over Jesus' feet. She says, you are exclusively mine. All of me. All of you. Not this lifestyle. Not this perfume. You, Jesus. Let me tell you how you love Jesus extravagantly. It's when you break your alabaster jar over his feet. It's when you take what is most precious to you, 
what you guard, what you cherish, your crutch, your addiction, your stronghold, and surrender it to Jesus. Lifting your hands in worship is good. I challenge you. Your body posture makes a difference. But more than that, it's when you offer up your eating, eating disorder at his feet. It's you saying, Jesus, take this broken relationship. It's yours. I lay down my lustful mind, addicted to porn. It's yours. I give you my bitter heart. I lay it at your feet. It's yours. Uh, take my addictions. Take my regrets. Take my trophies. Take my loves. Take my hates. Take everything I idolize. Anything I depend on apart from you, Jesus, I lay it at your feet. And when I rise up, I will obey everything you say about those things. That's what it means to love extravagantly. Because no amount of flowers, no amount of chocolates, no amount of romance can ever justify a divided heart. You know, if I'm at the altar, I say, Julie, I'll give you my finances. I'll give you everything but this girlfriend on the side. I'm not making out of that chapel married. I'm not. It's all of me. All of me loves all of you. And if you have never felt like you crossed over the threshold into the presence of Jesus and loved him and experienced his love, maybe the thing holding you back is an alabaster jar you have yet to break over his feet. So that's the invitation for you today. I'm going to have you stand. And we're going to sing this song called Extravagant. And there's a line in there. It says, here is all my love. It's yours. No conditions. I believe the Holy Spirit's going to put his finger on something today. And he's going to press you to lay that thing at the feet of Jesus. And here's my faith challenge to you. What you let go, you receive tenfold. Whatever you drew from that alabaster jar, when you surrender it, you're going to rise up receiving so much more. And if you have a poverty of his love, if you can't attach the word extravagant to your experience of love for Jesus, I invite you, may this be the moment you experience it when you lay your life down at his feet.